Good morning. You're all very welcome to this morning's Signpost Series webinar, uh, which is brought to you in association with Dairy Sustainability Ireland, National Rural Network, and Food Drink Ireland Skillnet. My name is Tom O'Dwyer, uh, head of the Signpost program with Chagask, uh, and I'll be your host for this morning's webinar. Uh, on this morning's webinar, I'm joined by two Chagas colleagues. Uh, Dr. George Ramsbottom, head of the Signpost Advisory Program, uh, joins uh, us to tell us more about the Chagas Signpost Advisory Program. Uh, and I'm also joined um, on the webinar this morning by another colleague, Maeve O'Hagan. Uh, she's one of our new climate, uh, climate Action and Sustainability Advisors working on the Signpost Advisory Program. And uh, Maeve will help me with questions later on the webinar. Uh, good morning to you both, George and Maeve. Morning, Tom. Morning, Tom. George, um, you're going to talk to us uh, on this morning's um, webinar about the Signpost Advisory Programme. Um, before we start, maybe um, for, for our listeners, maybe could you maybe tell us a little bit about, about yourself? You're, you're new to this role, but you've, you've had a, 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 a long career with Chagas. <laughs> Thanks, Tom. I'm 30 years in Chagas in a month's time, so it was a fast 30 years. Uh, most of it has been spent. Uh, a few years were spent initially as an advisor around the country. I was in. I did a master's um, similar to an MAIS that Maeve has done. I did one in in Wexford in 1990, which is 1992. So it's well before Maeve was born. And then I went along and uh, I joined as an advisor down in Tipperary. Spent a couple of very happy years down in Tipperary, and then a couple of great years in Wicklow. And uh, then I went and I worked in HQ for six or eight months in Sandy Mount Avenue before they pulled it down. And uh, that was in the PR department. It was a great experience. And it certainly uh, made me um, uh, certain that I, I didn't want to work in an industrial or a city setting. I wanted to be out in a more rural area. Uh, but it was a great experience. And I got back then to Kildalton to work as a dairy, dairy specialist. Spent a year on an exchange in New Zealand, um, and uh, the guy that replaced me was sitting beside you in the in a shared mm. office in Kildalton. And I came back then, and I worked as a dairy specialist in Kildalton, Grange, and Oak Park. So I've been around the block a fair bit now at this stage. And then was lucky enough to get this role from the role working with the signpost advisory side of the program in uh, April of this year. Okay. Right. Uh, so you're bringing all your experience as uh, as an advisor, as a specialist, and as um, uh, working from in PR in your uh, experience in PR uh, to to bear on this new role, I guess. So George, at this stage, I'll ask you to share your screen and um, commence your presentation. Uh, for those of you listening online, um, as as with every other week, you can submit your questions as George is making his presentation using the Q&A function at the bottom of the, the Zoom screen. Um, Maeve and I will, will uh, keep an eye on the questions as they come in. And once George is uh, finished his presentations, um, uh, Maeve and I will, will put those questions to George. Um, so uh, the more questions we have, the, the, the more questions we can put to George. So George, uh, over to you then. So um, look, at, I'm just going to talk to you, bring you through the, the advisory element of the whole the signpost uh, program. So it's, there's three or four different parts to it. Tom is, I would consider Tom more the industry facing side of it. And I'm more the, I would consider the farmer facing side of the signpost program. Uh, that's how I describe it. So um, there's kind of three pillars to the whole climate action uh, piece that Chagas is in, engaging with. On the right hand side there, you can see the the center for, it's basically, I call it the climate center, basically. Um, and it's been headed up by um, a team mostly from, well, based in Johnstown at the moment. So they're, they're working, it's a virtual center, they're working on uh, some of the newer technology that we need to uh, bring along with us to try and achieve the targets in terms of climate that have been set for us. The second key element to the program is in the middle, that's the Sustainability Digital Platform. It's kind of the fancy name for uh, AgNav, really, is what it's about, is what the core of it is. And uh, we'll come back to that in a few minutes because it's central to the work that I'm involved in. And the element on the left-hand side then, or the third pillar, is the signpost advisory program. And to me, that's the piece that I'm working with. And I'm going to go into the details of that now in a second. So um, this is a very large and very cluttered board. It's one of the boards we have for to describe the sign, the what we're doing in the signpost advisory program. It'll be presented in Moorpark on Tuesday next at the Dairy Open Day. 
why should you sign up? Uh, you should sign up to, to track your own carbon footprint, see what initiatives you're what initiatives you're engaging in and what the impact of those initiatives and what the new technologies you adopt can have in your carbon footprint. But why you should sign up as well is because many of the actions that you can adopt are good for you and good for the environment and can deliver both positives from an environmental perspective and even more money in your pocket. Uh, engaging with climate actions would present opportunities for your farm and the consumer is demanding a lower carbon footprint from the food that we produce, which is fair enough. What's the program about? There's three elements to it. There's the know your number part, which is establishing what your, your carbon footprint is. There's the commitment to change, which is about putting a plan in place or an action list in place for your farm that will help to reduce your carbon footprint. And then there's the support that we can offer in terms of making sure that the actions are adopted. What, uh, what do we expect from the program is over on the right hand side. So we'll come into the, we'll talk a little more about the, the team that we're putting in place of which uh, or of whom Maeve, who's on the team here today is one of the, is one of those advisors. There'll be workshops and training opportunities to learn more about climate change and reducing your emissions. You'll be offered one-on-one uh, -on -one advisory uh, support to implement, implement the changes on your farm. And you'll be you know, invited to events and demonstrations to show the new practices and technologies that you can engage with. George, and George the, sorry, just Tom. one moment. There's a couple of comments in on the, on the Q&A. Just can you press hide on your, yeah, just there. That's great, sorry. perfect, thank you. Yeah, that's actually showing, is it? Shippers. Another more, more technology I have to adopt myself. And uh, the, the Tom, your, your kind of focus is on the, sign, the signpost demonstration farms. This is a, the cohort of 120 farms around the country that are our flagships for the kind of climate action initiatives that you can take to uh, reduce the carbon footprint. And this is a kind of a, a cohort of farmers that the participants in the signpost advisory program, which is up to 50,000 farmers between now and 2030, can use as templates for the change that they're going to make on their own farm. Down in the right hand corner there we have a QR code that brings you into the uh, signpost advisory program website on our on our on our own sites here and you can you know you can sign up for the program or you can find out more about the program uh, using that QR code. So if you look at the signpost for advisory program then there are four core core elements to it that we need to everyone needs to be aware of the first is it's available to all farm all farmers and we need we need to engage with as many farmers as possible the second key element to it is that it's an, an enhanced advisory and training support uh, program which is in which we have 21 specialized advisors i'll come back to them in a minute and who are dedicated to delivery of climate action initiatives on a max, the maximum number of farms. When you engage in the program, you will establish your number, your carbon footprint. We'll help you to do that using the AgNav tool we're going to come back to in a minute. And we'll help you to generate a plan or an action plan or some action, an action list for your own farm to help you to reduce the carbon footprint that you have. And we have a really ambitious plan that we need 50,000 farmers participating in this program between now and 2030. There's a massive target of a 25% reduction in, in gaseous emissions between now and 2030. And we need you know, maximum per, per, uh, participation in the program to achieve that target. Why are we, why are we focused on a kind of a dedicated program for uh, the signpost uh, team? Well, there's two reasons. It's, the first is to accelerate the adoption of the technologies that are already there. And if we're honest about it, we can see um, that the technologies that are already in place will reduce on average the carbon footprint or the gaseous emissions from farm by about 18, 18 or 20 percent. But it's also to have a team in place to support the adoption of future technologies. These are the ones that are being developed at the moment. So, for example, things like um, the key one would be um, around methane inhibitors uh, at ruminant level, because ruminants are our largest, are the largest emitter of greenhouse gases in, in the country. So we're, we're working on technologies to reduce the amount of methane that they produce. And we know that methane can be a fairly potent uh, gaseous um, uh, greenhouse gas, basically. So we, we need the advisory program. We need a dedicated team 
to accelerate the adoption of technolo technologies that are already there and to be there to support the adoption of the emerging technologies or future technologies that are going to come on stream over the next number of years. The other reason for the signpost program is to highlight the progress that's already been made through advisory work and on farm. So if we look like if we look at some of the technologies that are already uh, available and we're working on, we're working on the promotion of technologies like low emission slurry spreading, on the use of protected urea, on a, a big focus on, on the application of lime, which will result in lower a lower requirement for nitrogen fertilizer. The protected urea has a, a massive impact on the emissions uh, coming from fertilizers, emissions coming from fertilizer. And we know that the, while it's, it's a difficult enough technology to adopt, in my opinion, the incorporation of clover has huge potential because it has a massive impact on the quantity of nitrogen that you're going to require to produce the decent yields of, of grass for grazing and for silage. Now, if we look at maybe some of the progress that's been made over the last number of years, if we look at the, the, the uptake of protected urea, for example, in this uh, area here, we can see that there's a gradual, a very slow but gradual increase in the proportion of nitrogen that's been applied in the form of urea. The blue bars are from, from for dairy farms, and the first three columns here refer to the national, the national situation. So by about 21, about 10% or so of the protected urea uh, of the nitrogen used on dairy farms was coming in the form of protected urea. It's been slowly increasing, and you'll see a rapid uptake in the next couple of years. If you look at the signpost dairy farms, it's gone to about 35 or 40 percent. And we know it has a massive impact on gaseous emissions on farms, and it's a really positive story. On the beef side of the house, there's been a slower uptake. But having, say, having said that, in, in 2021, on the signpost beef farms that Tom is engaging with, almost a quarter of the nitrogen that they used was in the form of protected urea. The story is even more positive when we come to low emission slurry spreading. And again, it's a, another area of progress that we'll, we'll be highlighting over the coming years. So the proportion of, of slurry applied using low emission slurry spreading technologies, you can see it's ramping up substantially. And it's almost 75% of slurry spread on dairy farms is coming in the form of low emission slurry spreading technologies. And it's about a quarter of the slurry spread nationally on beef farms. And again, if we look at the signpost farms in, for 2021, that compared to their uh, national average counterparts, they're using you know, nearly 90% of the slurry spread on dairy farms was spread using low emission slurry spreading equipment. And almost half of the slurry spread on beef farms was coming from low emission slurry spreading uh, technologies. So the purpose, I suppose, of the signpost program will be to highlight the progress being made on farms and the purpose of the signpost uh, program is to you know put out exemplars or kind of farm leaders who can show the initiative in terms of adopting the technologies that we've there. What kind of steps can you take? Now we, we know taking steps are hard. So we, we've ranked, we have um, messaging going out and it's available to all farmers around the kind of the core steps that you can take on different farms. So on the left hand side it's around dairy farms, on the right hand side of this uh, slide it's around beef or suckler farms. So a lot of the core technologies, you know, they're ranked by their ease of use. So things like protected urea and lime and soil fertility are down near the bottom. They're you know, relatively easy to adopt. And maybe using uh, low emission slurry spreading equipment is, is down uh, for all types of farms down at the bottom. Further up along the line, you have things around better grassland management, which may be more difficult, but also really important and very impactful on gaseous emissions. You've, you've improved animal health and improved genetic merit for dairy and beef farms. Uh, you've in increased output uh, per cow in terms of <clears throat> milk solids production or calf live weight, and then reducing age at first calving and uh, clover incorporation, maybe the, maybe the more difficult one, but in the long term, it'll have, again, have a massive impact on our carbon footprint. So there's loads of steps out there, and we have tailored messaging for dairy, beef, and uh, dairy farms, beef farms, suckler farms that are available for you to, to engage with and discuss with with our signpost advisory team. Our team has just been put in place and is just starting to work. Maybe I think it's you on the left-hand side there in the team. We had a training day back in April for the team before they actually started in the role. 
Tom, you were in the photograph there hiding behind Seamus Carney. And the team is spread from the north of Donegal down to Kerry and over to Wexford. So the team now is just being put in place and is starting, is open for business and is starting to run a series of workshops. That's an important message. So they're now on the ground and starting to engage with farmers in terms of gauges emissions. We're launching the programme throughout the country. So you'll, you'll probably be aware of the series of launches that have already taken place. This is a picture that I launched about 10 days ago in, in, uh, in the Carlow, Wexford, Wicklow constituency. And we've in, we invited you know, industry players, I, the IFA, ICMSA, ICSA, the different farming organisations. We signpost farmers at it. We had county council people at it. And we had other industry players who will all be influential in the, in the coming years to try and drive home the initiative for us on farm. We're, we're running these, these launches on a regional level because it's important that the industry and the farming population in general are aware of who the signpost advisors are that they can access or, or contact to move the initiative along in their own area. Look at, uh, we're starting with the low hanging fruit. Um, and we're, what I mean by that is we're dealing with farmers who have already applied. We're starting to contact farmers who have already applied uh, to join the program and participate. The details have been allocated to the different regional units and are being distributed to signpost advisors at the moment. The other areas of kind of people who will access fairly quickly is existing discussion groups and farmers who are involved in der derogation or farmers who have a lot of uh, contact with their with their advisors on the ground. By the sick by the middle of June, we'd completed around twenty workshops, with around two hundred farmers already engaged in, in those workshops. Um, so, just in terms of the actions that you take, is the first step along the line is to well, obviously, to apply for the program. Then, at the workshop, you will uh, learn establish what the not your number is, your carbon number is. Um, what kind of gaseous emissions are being produced and we'll, we'll develop a, we'll develop a, we'll give you your own carbon number and the second step then will be to prepare the the plan at, that that'll be done sometimes at the workshops and sometimes it's been done uh, as a kind of a follow-up step three then is support by the local advisors or the signpost advisors to support delivery of the plan uh, of the action plan that you develop uh, for your farm and we'll be monitoring the trends and actions taken in terms of greenhouse gas, gas emissions on the, for the individual participants and for the, the wider industry uh, over the next number of years and, and establish what's going on. So for most people, it'll start with a workshop, but it doesn't necessarily mean a workshop for farmers. How, how are we establishing the number that uh, people, your carbon number is through the AGNAV program that's available to us? So we, we'll uh, get you to give us consent. We'll get farmers to give us consent to access their um, gaseous emissions number through the AGNAV program. So for this farm here, uh, we can, we've can we established that the, the carbon number of total emissions for his farm is equivalent of a thousand uh, ton of CO2 equivalent for the farm. Where that data is coming, or those data are coming from, they're coming from the Borbia Sustainability Audit We've, uh, we've linkages with them, strong linkages with Borbia to establish the sustainability survey data for individuals' farms. And we're also linking in with the data coming from ICBF. So the AGNAV program is dependent on a three-way initiative between Borbia, ICBF, and Chagask. And the three of them are working really closely to develop the AGNAV program. So we establish, first of all, for the individual, what their greenhouse gas emissions are. So here it's a thousand ton of emissions of carbon dioxide equivalent for the, the farm in question. It's a large scale dairy farm. The emissions per hectare uh, then is calculated using the data from the sustainability survey. So it works out for this farm at almost 11 ton of carbon dioxide per hectare. And this is a, a specialist dairy farm. So we know that the emissions, his carbon footprint per kilo of milk produced is uh, working out at 0.78 kilos of CO2 equivalent per hectare. Now, one of the things that's being developed in the AGNAV, and it's not all there yet, but some of the actions can already be uh, generated. So we can say that for this farm here, that if he looks at 
uh, going from, I think it's 25% uh, use of protected urea to 90% use of protected urea for this particular farm. The impact of that on his gaseous emissions is to incur a three and a half percent reduction in CO2 equivalent. So he's down from 101 tons to 98 tons of carbon dioxide equivalent uh, from his farm just by taking one simple action uh, over, the, over the coming years. And the, the value of the AgNav is twofold. Number one, it tells us what the number is. And number two, it allows us to uh, see the impact of individual actions and sometimes combined actions on the on the number, the carbon number for that farm. So once we know the number, we have a huge starting point to make change on the farm. The second step then that the climate or action advice, the climate advisors or the signpost advisors will, will make is they'll help the farmer to pick the most uh, suitable uh, actions for their farm. And the so for example, this is a kind of a mock-up of what the farm plan would look like for an individual. So in this case here, um, some of the initiatives that he's talking about taking will be to improve soil fertility and, and in, increase the length of the grazing season on the farm. So we'll, the second step will be to create an action list for the farm, and then there'll be ongoing support by the signpost advisor of the program participants to ensure that the actions are carried out on the farm. At the Moor Park Open Day, we're, we'd, we'd love to see as many farmers come up to us as possible in our climate village. And we're going to give them a card going away. They, they'll grant us access to their, to their uh, AgNav uh, program. And once they grant us access to that, we can uh, tell them what their total emissions in carbon dioxide are, what their emissions per hectare are, and what their carbon footprint per kilo of milk production is. And we'll, we'll give them some an opportunity then to sign up for the program on the day and generate an action list on the day for them to reduce their carbon footprint. So we'd love to see as many farmers engaging in this initiative as possible. So as, I suppose finally, my last slide, <clears throat> what, can, what am I saying in, to, in, in general? I, I'm saying, look, we, we have a very clear target to work towards in the 25% gaseous emissions that have been set for the sector. Knowing the carbon footprint on individuals' farm will give them also a very clear target that they have to work towards in terms of gaseous emissions reduction. We have now just got a dedicated team of advisors in place to help farmers, to work with farmers to reduce those gaseous emissions. We have technologies that are now in place to, reduce, to substantially reduce the gaseous emissions from individual farms. And research is ongoing, and I'm confident that over the next couple of years, we'll have the technologies in place to achieve the 25% gaseous emissions targets set for the industry. But, in some, but people need to engage with the program and take actions to ensure that they, that they achieve the targets that have been set for them on an industry basis. Tom, I'm going to leave it at that. I'm going to um, stop sharing here now, and we'll take any questions that people may have for us. Is that okay? Thank you, George. Thanks very much for a very comprehensive uh, presentation and a, a great overview of the, the new uh, signpost advisory program. So um, I know there's questions coming in on the Q&A function on Zoom. So just to remind listeners, if they want to submit their questions, they can type them into the Q&A function. And uh, my colleague Maeve and myself, we're, we're keeping an eye on them. Um, and we're, we're, we'll select uh, those and, and, uh, and put them to you, George. Before handing over to Maeve, um, I just have, have one question which occurred to me as I was watching your presentation. It, it, it didn't feature in the, in the, it hasn't featured in the chat yet, but um, it's one that occurred to me. So I'll, I'll just put it to you and we'll get to the, the questions on the Q&A then. Um, I was struck, George, by the, the rapid adoption of less technology. You, you showed a, a chart and, and you explained that, that there's been a, you know, a, a fairly, uh, there, has, there has been a significant increase in the usage of low emission slurry spreading technology over the last couple of years. And I yeah. suppose two, two parts to my question, wh why do you think that happened? You know, wh what was the reason for farmers adopting that technology so rapidly? Um, and I suppose the second part then is some other technologies that, that you mentioned as well through your presentation, they're a harder sell, they're, they're you know, they're, they're slower uptake. And would you speculate maybe on, on why, why that's the case? 
Um, look at Tom, the first part um, is a combination of stick and carrot. Uh, and that's about the lower emission story. If we're being very honest about it, we've seen you know rapid uptake of less lower emission story spending, mostly on dairy farms, because a lot of dairy farms are, are operating at a high stocking rate. And some of these are in derogation and it's been a mandatory element of the program for, for them for a number of years. That's, mm. that's the kind of the stick side of it. But there's also been carrot. What's happened as a result of that is we've seen contractors in particular and a lot of farmers buy the equipment themselves. And they're, they're seeing really great benefits from using low emission storage bedding. Any farmer you talk to that uses a trailing shoe or the dribble bar will tell you that there's a noticeable improvement in the amount of nitrogen that they're able to generate from that slurry and using that slurry. And you can see the difference. So it's spreading now by word of mouth as well. It's, it's a fantastic technology. And it, even though it's an expensive technology, it's, it's um, there's a very, there's a pretty you know, a reasonable payback in terms of the benefits that they're seeing both from an environmental and from an economic perspective. So I'd say it was, it's, um, it's a combination of the two, Tom. Now, Tom, you, you, you and I both know then that adoption of tech, for the adoption of technologies, uh, whatever the technology is, it, it, there needs to be a number of, there are a number of elements involved. And the key ones around things, we'll say, for example, like clover, uh, would be, are there, is it, is it, can it be broken down into small parts? So the, the answer to that is yes. Is it easy to adopt? The answer to that, honestly, is no. It's not simple. It's not easy to get clover incorporated unless you're receding. And we don't receive an awful lot a year. So this is going to be a much slower burn. The, the benefits are clear to those who use it. But it's a slower burn in that it, it'll take quite a number of years to get incorporation of clover successful on many farms. Hmm. It'll take time. And it's dependent on, you know, a lot of moving parts. So you need reasonably good fertility. You need lime working well. And grazing management particularly in the establishment phase, is more complicated. Mm. So that's going to take a bit of time as well, Tom. So, it's going to, so things like clover and cooperation will take longer to get adopted. But Tom, that's why we have the signpost advisor team in, in place. Mm. And that's to help with the adoption of, of things that may have only dying to get out on farms and help farmers to um, adopt those sort of technologies. So some of them are easy, relatively easy to adopt and more of them are going to become more complex and longer term. And there'll be, there'll, be, there'll be twists. As I say to people, there'll be a few bends on the roads. It's not all going to be sunshine and roses. There's going to be a few gloomy days as well when things didn't work very well and we'll take a bit of time to straighten them out. Mm. Okay, th th thanks, George. Um, I'm going to hand over to my colleague, Maeve, who's been keeping an eye on the questions. Just a reminder again, if you want to ask a question, use the Q&A function and, and we can see those and we put them to George. So over to you, Maeve. Yeah, thanks, Tom. Um, yeah, the questions are coming in thick and fast here, George, uh, especially in terms of the um, the AgNav system. So okay. um, I might throw a few of them over to you. Um, I suppose the first thing is, how do farmers access AgNav themselves? So farmers can access AgNav themselves if they go into the system and look up, look it up through their ICBF account. The, Ag the AgNav uh, program at this stage is available to them uh, through that system. So yeah, there, so using the same problem. login details as ICBF. I, I, my understanding is that's correct, yeah. Okay, perfect. And then um, in terms of what's actually accounted for in AgNav, are the likes of hedgerows and carbon sinks and sequestration, is that accounted for in AgNav or what's actually accounted for in the calculation of the carbon footprint? Yeah, so un unfortunately at, at the moment, the, the sequestration benefits of hedgerows is calculated separately and won't and isn't currently included in AgNav because it's not part of your it's not part of your agricultural carbon footprint. It's calculated under the land use and land use change element of the pro of the of the calculator at the moment. It's calculated completely separately at the moment. Yeah. Um, and then does a farmer need to be in board be it to get picked up by AgNav? And then just in terms of um, maybe farmers with either mixed enterprise or yeah. with tillage and sheep, then is that being pulled into AgNav also? So just at the moment, we can't generate, we cannot generate a figure for the sheep farms and to generate a figure for the beef farms. All the dairy farms are included because all the dairy farmers have a store, a sustainability survey done. But in total, there's about almost 60,000 farms who've completed a sustainability survey. And once we have that survey, we can complete the, we can, we can generate an AgNav or a carbon footprint number for them. So they need to have a sustainability survey done. 
the weakness at the moment, honestly, is the sheep. We don't have the sheep data available to us to generate the survey. For mixed farms, so someone with dairy and beef, we'll generate, if there was substantial beef, if it was a small beef enterprise, no, but if it was a reasonably substantial beef enterprise, it doesn't have to be massive. You'll get a figure for both your cows and milk footprint and also your beef footprint. Um, and maybe just a related question there I noted from David um, Maeve on the, on, uh, on the questions in relation to the allocation of inputs and outputs to individual yeah. enterprises. Uh, George, would you comment on that? Um, do, does Agnav handle that, you know, and kind of takes yeah. it out of the farmer's hands, so to speak? Yeah, it, it's, do, it's doing a really good job allocating it. This peer-reviewed papers that Jonathan Heron has been involved with, that are behind, Lawrence are behind, Lawrence Chilu are behind, mm. behind it, that are, that are allocating it for us uh, behind the scenes. So it's all done nice and neatly behind the scenes. So it's just giving you an, an individual, a total figure, a per hectare figure, and a, and a figure for the per kilo live weight and the per kilo of milk produced. So it's all done first time. And mm -hmm. just following up on that, George, then there's a good question here in terms of out of those metrics that are provided to you by Agnab, which one of those is best to go by? Um, you know, just bearing in mind, like, are we focusing on absolute reduction and then versus the emissions intensity per kilogram of product? Well, I put my hand up and say that I focus a lot on the per kilo stuff, but Tom tells me I'm wrong. And Tom is usually right. Tom tells me that from a, a national perspective, that it's the it's the absolute figure we need to really we need to, to hammer up, we need to reduce because that's that's what we live or die by as a as an industry uh, over the next number of years. It'll be the, the total figure will be the core figure. Yeah. Mm. But I, I suppose just to come in on that, George, um, yeah. in terms of um, working with farmers and providing a farmers with some sense of a benchmark of where their farm is relative to perhaps the national average in terms of uh, a measure. Um, you know, you can't compare farms on their total emissions because farm size will have and scale and level of intensity will have a huge impact on that. But you can give farmers a sense of where they are when you compare their carbon footprints or carbon intensity or uh, emissions per hectare. So it, it, I, in my mind, I think it ha I'm, I'm softening a little bit, George, maybe it has, it has to be a combination of, of, of all three metrics, the total emissions yeah. and then your emissions per hectare and, and per kilo of product. Yeah, yeah, okay. Um, and then just in terms of, um, I suppose, some of the other environmentally based programs that we have going on in Chagas, there's a question there just regarding the likes of the ACID program that focuses on water quality and, you know, how will the signpost program tie in with that to make sure that we're achieving, I suppose, both our water quality targets and our greenhouse gas targets in tandem? Well, I suppose internally we've close working relations with the ACID team. That's the first point to make. So... The, what's going on here, the, the team in ASAP are, are well aware of what we're doing in the signpost programme. We're all working closely together and trying to coordinate it. The second point to make on it, um, Maeve, is the fact that a lot of the initiatives that we're taking here, or a lot of the, this, the, the technologies that we're get, trying to get adopted for on, under the signpost programme are actually really compatible with what's going on on the, on the ASAP programme as well. So they're, kind of, they're pretty compatible, to be honest with you, the two programmes, and, and we're working closely together. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and then just in terms of then the you talked about the complications that can be associated with using clover as a measure for reducing greenhouse gases. There's a question there just in terms of using clover on heavier soil types and high organic matter soils. And, and is that something that's going to be workable? At the moment, look, I, I'll be honest with you. We we know that the a lot of the data has been generated, the early data has been generated on clover incorporation has been done in Clonakilty, which is a lovely light free draining farm, and it's also been followed up with with work at Moor Park. Just at the moment, we're investigating the the incorporation of clover on a on a heavier uh, farm up in Ballyhays. No, if you're if you're from Ballyhays, you, you, some people say it's not a heavy, but if you're from Leash, I tell you, it's, it's a heavy, it's a heavy enough soil up there. And look at the early, the early, um, what we say, the early uh, indicators are that it's working pretty well. Um, we'll have a better, we'll have a better handle of it in, in the next year or two as the results of maybe three or four years later are pulled together on the incorporation of clover onto heavier farms. Uh, Donald, Donald Patton would say that he, he's, he's doing it and it's working for him. We know better in the years ahead. I think it'll work. It may, it may require slightly different. Um, uh, management to lighter farms but what what that is at the moment i don't really know give, give us a bit of time and if we're working on it i think it'll work 
but we, we just need a bit more time to get it straightened out. Yeah, and I suppose, like you said, like with clover, it always is a bit of a moving feast, isn't it? Like, you know, different farms are going to behave differently when it comes to clover. Absolutely. Uh, yeah, indeed. Um, but I, I guess the, the key thing maybe would be to um, see if we can get it working on some farms on heavier soils and, and use those as demonstrations. And I guess one of the heavier so soils that I'm familiar Far, heavier soils farms that yeah, I'm familiar with yeah. is, is Solihead in, in Tipperary yeah, and our colleague James Humphreys has successfully incorporated clover at a high high level um, and it's working no, no, very no. well on that particular farm um, so there may there, there in, undoubtedly will be farm to farm variations so George there's a question on the chat from um, I, I'm, I'm after losing it there now I, I, I um, how, how do farmers contact uh, the the new signpost climate action sustainability advisors that that you've referred to in your presentation so the handiest way is just to look up the website the Chicago's website and uh, and find you'll find the contact details for all the signpost advisors in the different regions listed on that hmm. Now, I'll, I'll just come back to a point. I see someone's put in something there, Maeve, about uh, they've applied online and heard nothing. In the next week or so, we, we'll make sure that everyone who has, has uh, applied online, the advisor are only just kind of settling into the roles at the moment. We'll, we'll, and we're, we're going to do a big, a, big, a big drive at Moore Park to get more people to sign up online. And towards the end of next week, the, the plan is that we will put a push on that the advisors, the signpost advisors, will be in contact with people who signed up online to make sure that they, they get invited to one of the workshops that's taking place over the next number of weeks. Okay. Yeah, and I and, suppose just um, a very relevant question there as well that's come in a couple of times is, is this program only available to Chagas clients? Um, is it open to people who engage with private consultants and, and, and how, how would they engage with it? We, we want everyone to engage in the program, Maeve. Because if we're to have an impact on the gaseous emissions from the industry, we need we need uh, as as ma maximum engagement. We're not confined the program to Chagas clients. It's free to everyone to participate in the program, irrespective of who their their um, advisor is. It doesn't have to be a Chagas advisor, or, or they don't have to be Chagas clients to engage in this program. Um, I think I I I, I better clarify a point that was made earlier, George, in relation to access to Agnav. Um, our colleague Seamus has messaged me just to remind yeah, me yeah. that. Uh, access to Agnav is um, is only available to farmers who are who are participating through the signpost advisory program. So I, at the moment, I think it's it's a, it's what's called a closed pilot. So um, oh, yeah, no, they're going to open they're going to open a wider Tom. I forgot it wasn't out. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So I suppose what we're what we're asking is you know together with our partners ICBF and Board Bia, I suppose if if farmers can can engage with the signpost advisory program we'll take them through Agnav for the first occasion and um, at, at a later stage, then they can go back in and, and look at it themselves. So um, yeah, yeah, just sh sh my colleague, our colleague Seamus messaged me on that. So, okay. okay. Um, so yeah, I just I see a couple of questions coming in there. Um, everyone's obviously envious of the signpost advisory program and what's available through it because they're asking about availability for to, for I suppose other enterprises other than dairy and beef so is there um a, advice available there for tillage sheep pig poultry farms horticulture being asked about there as well yeah so I, I'll be honest and say that the the most accurate calculations we have at the moment are for for dairy and beef but uh, we, we get those off the ground we're going to get those off the ground first because they're going to have the biggest impact on reducing our emissions but the, there is ongoing work now. Don't ask me how long it's going to take. I'm not, maybe Tom knows. There's ongoing work for the other enterprises to bring them in into the system as well. And it'll take place over the coming months or, or year or something like that. Yeah. But they, they yeah, will be yeah, available. Yeah. To be honest, they're not quite there at the moment for the other enterprises, to be honest with it. And yeah. I suppose the, just the on the anticipation, that, there is, then, the there is some of them included that. on your side of things there, Tom, in the signpost demonstration farms. Mm. So you, you better put those questions to me, I guess, Maeve, yeah. if you want. <laughs> yeah, so I think there's a question there about the selection of farmers for the sign. The, the, um, I, I guess it, it refers to the signpost farms. So we have 125 farms that are operating as demonstration farms and are, I suppose, pointing the way forwards in terms of the adoption of the, the technologies that George referred to in his presentation. Um, 
how were they selected? Um, they were selected through our um, local advisory network. So we, we contacted our advisors uh, spread across the country and we asked them to, to identify farmers that, that could make potential or would be interested in participating as demonstration farmers. We also worked with our partners in the signpost program. So mm -hmm. the various um, milk and meat processors in, in the main to select those farmers. So they, they're, they're, they're separate to what George has described. Um, so the signpost advisory program is for all farmers. And uh, just following up on that then, Tom, is there an inclusion of orga any organic farmers in the signpost demonstration program? Yes, we, we have five organic farmers participating in the, in the signpost uh, um, farms program. Um, and um, yeah, we're, we're monitoring those farms and working with those farms in the same way as as the other 120 conventional farmers, and and any you know any of the organic far, non non signpost farmers who want to participate in the program, we are only delighted to have them on board as well. Mm. Yeah, mm. perfect. Um, I suppose just maybe jumping back to something that you were talking about earlier on, George, in terms of like the importance of the adoption of protected urea, and. Um, you know, is it something that you would foresee in the future in terms of other straight nitrogen products not being available on the market to try and more so lean people towards protected urea? How do you see that going in the future? Yeah, so um, I, I think what will happen is, is like everything else. Um, I, I look back over 20 years working with EBI or 22 or three years working on the it, it becomes part of the cultural norm that you do things a certain way. It's amazing the way people forget how things used to be mm -hmm. and what becomes the norm um, changes over time. And what we're going to see over the next number of years uh, is just a gradual, you know, a gradual rise, a fairly, I would say, it's even a substantial increase in the proportion of protected urea used. And it will become in the next number of years the main uh, nitrogen fertilizer of choice when straight nitrogen is being applied. It, it's just going to happen, Nave, and people won't even know it's happening. It, it's, it's working really well. There's no reason to use any other form of straight nitrogen than protected urea. And it, it's, it's on, a, on a cost per kilo basis. When you allow for the higher uh, utilization rate compared even to conventional urea, it's on neck and neck with conventional urea, even though it's slightly dearer than it. It, it, works, out this, it works out the same. Uh, per kilo and it's much cheaper than can it's going to become the urea it's going to become the nitrogen fertilizer of choice over the next number of years so cultural things happen over a few years and become the cultural norm and this is one of those things that just happened like a train it reminds me of the early days of the bbi in many ways yeah yeah it, more of a, a mindset change i suppose that'll take place then and if like you said it'll be the new norm it just becomes the new norm. We don't even realize it happens. It just happens. And this is one of those chains that we're in the, in the midst of at the moment. Yeah. It won't even be, won't even be a debate in a few years' time. Um, there's just another one there, I think, coming in for you, Tom. In terms of the signpost demonstration farm, then what ongoing work and research is actually being carried out on those demonstration farms? So I suppose from... Um... Yeah, from a demonstration point of view, I suppose the work is um, to support and encourage, um, motivate the demonstration farmers to adopt the technologies that George has referred to. Um, so, um, and George had the 12 steps up on screen at, at, at during his presentation. So, you know, starting from some of the, <clears throat> what we consider the easier steps to take, like correcting soil fertility, the application of lime, uh, the adoption of protected urea, and so on, moving up along then to maybe reducing chemical fertilizer nitrogen and up towards the top of the tree then, you know, better breeding and, um, or the top of the stairs, the top of the step, uh, better breeding and uh, the incorporation of clover. And George has already explained, you know, why some of those technologies are considered the first steps taken and why more of them are considered maybe some of the latter steps to take during a process uh, to reduce emissions. Um, so that's, that's the ongoing work, that's the demonstration piece. In, in relation to research, um, uh, I suppose the, the signpost farms are involved in uh, a, a key research uh, experiment uh, started by Chagas to come up with better estimates of soil carbon sequestration. So how much carbon is being stored in our soils 
on different types of farms, so a dairy farm versus a beef farm, on different levels of management intensity, so highly stocked versus lowly stocked, on different soil types, um, you know, mineral soils versus peat soils and so on. So we, we've got all those variables across our network of signpost demonstration farms, and there's an ongoing research experiment to, that will in time, so it's, it's, it's a long-term project, but in time, we will get a better estimate of the amount of carbon being stored on, on those soils. Um, um, and we're also um, taking measurements on the farms in relation to LIDAR, and that's measuring the above ground biomass uh, so that we can get an estimated amount of carbon stored in the hedgerows. So there, there are two research experiments that are ongoing on the signpost farms at the moment. And I suppose we thought in the news there this week, like just how crucial it is that the, the research that's being done, that the figures that we're using for calculating our emissions is as accurate as possible, you know. Mm -hmm. um, and then, George, just in terms of any farmers that are maybe trying to get, you know, they're, they're looking at their own farm and saying, I want to see reductions on my farm. What are the biggest measures that they can implement that will have the biggest impact on their greenhouse gases that they could put in place? For, for dairy so, and beef farms. Also. Yeah, for dairy and beef. So I suppose the core areas are around the change of nitrogen use if you're using fertilizers towards, you know, predominantly a protected urea as your as your key fertile as your key nitrogen. The next element will be around you know improving soil fertility because improving soil fertility through lime and getting your indexes right will also allow the incorporation of clover into the swards which in turn will reduce the demand for fertilizer nitrogen. And then you have ongoing things. The third key area then is around, you know, a better grazing management and better genetics for the herd. Better grazing management will allow animals to, to become more productive. So we finish our cattle earlier, we produce more milk per cow, and the better genetic animals of it, whether it's beef or dairy, on the, on the dairy side, it's more productive cows and more fertile cows. Um, and on the beef side, it's, you know, earlier finishing so we grazing management but also the genetics to allow us to finish the cattle earlier because the quicker cattle are slaughtered uh, the earlier they're slaughtered at the the more efficient their um their um, productivity per kilo of, of uh, live weight gain is so start with the nitrogen change work on the soil fertility and then deliver on you know health uh and better breeding and i suppose within the better breeding for example we've technology there on ebi we've technology on dbi and you have the whole opportunity that's coming now at the moment of doing kind of the whole whole herd genomic analysis to try and establish uh what are the most superior animals for breeding in the years ahead yeah so i suppose it's important for the farms to kind of assess where they stand currently first and then decide where they can go from there yeah yeah um, and it'll be slightly different for different farms so if, yeah. if you're not if you're not a big nitrogen user you know switching to protected peas is important protected urea is important but it mightn't be as important as you know, better grassland management for you. Do you know what I mean? Things like that. Yeah, absolutely. And the, yeah, and the use of the advisors then, the role of the advisors is to tailor a plan for your farm. Because change is not easy, but having the advisor on board will help you to facilitate, will help to facilitate the discussion on what's going to work best for you. Yeah. And, and then in terms of the 12 steps, George, um, you know, the, the 12 steps for reducing greenhouse gas emissions, um, how was that order actually decided on from 1 to 12, or is it just a guide in general for farmers to use? Yes. So, so it may be, it's a guide for the individual um, rather than a definitive uh, list for anyone. Um, for most people, um, why we put it in that order, it's, it's based on the kind of ease of use, and some of the bigger, the more impactful ones are also down near the bottom. But again, we're back to the advisor, get the advisor to sit down and tailor a plan that suits the individual farmer. I think that's the core, and that's one of the opportunities we have with the signpost advisory program to do that. And can I just come in there as well, George? I, I know I mentioned our colleague Seamus Carney on the broadcast um, previously, but I'll mention him again. I, I've seen him facilitate a very um, engaging exercise with a group of farmers where they're asked to um, rank the, the 12 suggested measures themselves and identify for themselves on their own farms what step they would take first. Yeah. So, you know, to me, I think, and and it's 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 how our advisors will work, I believe. It's it's about um engaging the far engaging with the farmer and agreeing with the farmer what steps are most suitable for the farmer's farm and, and what steps the, the farmer is willing to take. You know, we're 
you were not we're not trying to force measures on people but um but equally we, we can make recommendations and provide guidance so yeah but tom the great thing about the the industry we have is that we're, we're no one has been forced to do anything at mm -hmm. the moment no one has been forced to do anything and we have a massive opportunity we have a clear path for that people can follow to have a big impact on their gaseous emissions we're one of the few industries that has a clear pathway like this. Mm -hmm. And we have a program in place that we need people to engage with. You just start on that journey and start making the changes that are going to be impactful from an environmental perspective. We have a huge opportunity here in the agriculture industry. I'm, I'm really proud of the industry we're working. It's a brilliant industry. We have a path. We need to get on that journey and start moving. Mm -hmm. and, and change will happen. She will come. Yeah, and I suppose just following, following on from kind of what you were saying, like the, the change is going to come then, Tom, just in terms of the time frame that we have set out for ourselves, you know, 25% reduction in agricultural emissions um, by 2030, um, you know, it, it's a challenging target. So there's just a question there, um, you know, what level of emissions reduction do we realistically see ourselves being able to achieve within that time frame? Yeah, so Chagas guesstimates at the moment would be that we, we can deliver the 25% reduction, but there are a couple of provisos. Uh, one is that um, there's a stable herd. So, you know, we, we don't see a massive increase in, in uh, animal numbers, bovine numbers, mainly. Um, and secondly, that we get a very uh, a, a high rate of adoption of the technologies that we have mentioned during the presentation. So, you know, and again, as George has said, we have the opportunity now. Um, we want to help farmers. We want to work with farmers to deliver on the, on the national ambition to um, reduce emissions. Um, yeah, so it's, 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 it's up to farmers, you know, um, to make choices. And we believe, based on our estimates and models, that we can deliver the 25% uh, reduction, um, but, but it is... Um, dependent on a high uptake of the technology so that we move from, you know, a, a relatively low level of protected urea use to a much, much higher level of protected urea use as, as one example, that we get much more, more, more clover into our grassland swards, um, that we continue to improve soil fertility, that we reduce fertilizer nitrogen use. So all of the things that, that George, you know, talked about in his presentation that I suppose was maybe focused on the individual farmer level, if we can multiply that over many, many farms, we'll, we'll, we'll change the figures for the industry, you know? So, so that, that's the challenge that, that's ahead of um, Chagas, ahead of George, ahead of myself and yourself, uh, Maeve, um, to try and work with lots and lots of individual farmers to ensure that the figures for the overall agricultural sector uh, trend downwards. Yeah. yeah, so it's okay. a, a challenge, but as we've seen before, farmers are more than willing and able to rise to the challenge, I think, once they're given the tools to do it. Mm. Mm. I Agreed. suppose that's where, that's okay, where we'll so, come in. Okay, uh, Maeve, I think we're coming towards the end of our questions. I, I, I think we've exhausted most of the questions, so... Um, I think it's it's about time that we, we, we and we're also coming up against our time. Uh, so I'm I'm going to draw this uh, week's webinar to a close. Um, so I, I found out a very interesting discussion um, and uh, a great selection of questions uh, submitted by our audience this morning. So thanks thanks to you for uh, listening and for participating uh, in in uh, such a way through the the Q and A. Uh, thanks to my colleague George uh, for um, uh, preparing his presentation and, and making, making it this morning, and also to Maeve for your help uh, with the questions. Just to let you know, uh, next Friday, uh, the Signpost Series webinar is uh, entitled uh, Challenges for the Dairy Sector in the Netherlands. So the focus will be on the, the dairy sector in the Netherlands, and uh, the presenters next Friday morning will be Michael Dehan, who's a researcher from Wageningen Livestock Research in the Netherlands, and uh, he will be joined by a Dutch dairy farmer, I think. OK, so definitely a Dutch farmer, uh, but I, I presume a Dutch dairy farmer. And they will both talk about the challenges facing the dairy sector in the Netherlands. And I suppose uh, people have been reading about that or following it on social media. So that, that could be quite interesting and, and well worth tuning into. So that's next Friday morning at, at 930 so all that's left for me to do now is to, is to thank you very much for joining us this morning. I hope uh, you enjoyed our presentation and discussion. Uh, 
Uh, equally, I hope you have a, a great weekend. And my final uh, duty is to thank our production team this morning of Yvonne Marr and Andy Boland.